Hey, welcome back. So today we're going to talk about the faith of the seven, which is the most dominant religion in Westeros. And it's sometimes known as the holy faith or just the faith. And it is also referred to as the new gods to differentiate them from the old gods of the first men, you know, worshipping the trees. I think the most basic way to break it down is to compare it to the Christian religion in that they have the Holy Trinity. So they've got the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. They're each their own deities, but share the same essence and equal one God. The faith of the seven has seven aspects seven faces, the equal one deity. They are the seven who are one, so hence the faith of the seven. So let's have a look at who those seven aspects of their gods are. The father, who is also referred to as the father above, is depicted as a bearded man with a stern and strong face. Judgment is said to belong to the father. Additionally, he protects his children. He is often prayed to for justice, and the phrase, may the father judge them justly, is often said amongst the followers of the seven. Additionally, one might pray to the father, asking him to defend someone in battle, the strength to seek justice, and the wisdom to recognize it. The mother, sometimes also called the mother above, is a loving and protective aspect of the seven. She is often asked for mercy and to keep loved ones safe. Offerings can be made to the mother when a young woman becomes pregnant to praise the mother for giving the gift of life. The warrior is depicted with his sword and protects followers of the seven from their foes. The warrior is often prayed to for courage as the septons teach. Most men make offerings to the warrior before battle while others may say a prayer. Additionally, People might beseech the warrior for a favourable condition during battle, to watch over the soldiers, give them strength, keep them safe, both in battle and outside of battle, and help warriors to victory. He might also be asked to bring peace to the souls of the slain and give comfort to those who were left behind. A septum might ask the warrior to lend his strength to the arm of the man whose cause is just during trial by battle. The phrase, may the warrior defend you, and may the warrior give strength to your arm, are frequently given. The smith, depicted with his hammer, is the mender of broken things who puts the world of men to right. Septons teach to pray to the smith for strength, and the sailors might make offerings to the smith prior to launching a ship, as to keep their ships safe. Others might pray to the warrior for protection. The maiden, also called the maid, is a beautiful, innocent-looking young woman. People might pray to the maiden to keep young women safe. A mother might pray to the maiden to lend courage to her daughters and guard them in their innocence. While a bride might light candles in thanks if a suitable marriage offer is made, a woman may ask the maid for forgiveness when admitting to having used sex to convince men to do her bidding. The crone is an old, wizened and wise woman, whose statues often show her, with a raised lamp in one hand. People pray to the crone for wisdom and guidance. The stranger is neither male nor female, yet both at the same time. He is the outcast, the wanderer from far places, less and more than human, unknown and unknowable. His face is the face of death. He leads the newly deceased to the other world. Those who feel like outcasts might light a candle for the stranger. The aspects of the seven mean different things to our various characters in the story, and we see them pray specifically to the ones that are most meaningful to them, often depending on their situation. The gods had never meant much to Davos the smuggler, though, like most men, He had been known to make offerings to the warrior before battle, to the smith when he launched a ship, and to the mother whenever his wife grew great with child. Rob Stark might have prayed to the same gods as his father, the northern old gods. But maybe if he prays to the gods of his mother, the new gods, 
I imagine that he would pray to the warrior for strength before battle, or the father for wisdom before going into council. Catelyn, on the other hand, she's normally all about the mother and the crone, and why not? She's our main maternal figure in the story, early on at least. Side note, does Cersei ever pray? Because, Christ, could you imagine? Oh, Christ. <laughs> anyway, so, right, stop tangenting. Right, um, yeah, Catelyn, she can't act in the same way that men do, and so is less likely to pray to the warrior. So, yeah, she stands on the sidelines, watching, waiting, praying. She knelt before the mother. My lady, look down upon this battle with a mother's eyes. They are all sons, every one. Spare them if you can, and spare my own sons as well. Watch over Rob and Bran and Rickon. Although in times of relevant need, she even turns to the smith. Lost and weary, Caitlin Stark gave herself over to the gods. She knelt before the smith, who fixed things that were broken, and asked that he give her sweet Bran his protection. She went to the maid, and beseeched her to lend her courage to Arya and Sansa, to guard them in their innocence. To the father, she prayed for justice, the strength to seek it, and the wisdom to know it and she asked the warrior to keep Rob strong and shield him in his battles. Lastly, she turned to the crone, whose statues often showed her with a lamp in one hand. Guide me, wise lady, she prayed. Show me the path I must walk, and do not let me stumble into the dark places that lie ahead. Which isn't foreshadowing at all, right, <laughs> Stoneheart? Anyway, Tyrion, however, he's not a very pious man, but he's been forced into that kind of religion by his surroundings, and even he turns to them in desperate times. Tyrion lingered after his cousin had slipped away. At the warrior's altar, he used one candle to light another. Watch over my brother, you bloody bastard. He's one of yours. He lit a second candle to the stranger, for himself. So, how is the faith of the Seven worshipped? Religious worship is done in seven walled buildings called sets. The wealthier sets have statues and altars for each of the seven, whereas poorer sets might use carved masks or crude charcoal drawings of the seven. The altars are sometimes inlaid richly with mother of pearl, onyx, and lapis lazuli. Windows are from leaded glass, depicting scenes and pictures and a great crystal catches light, spreading it in a rainbow of colours. Septs can be found across the Seven Kingdoms, although they are rare in the north and absent in the Iron Islands. Some lords might agree to have a sept built upon their lands. In such cases, the septs are the property of the lord in question. Prayer in a sept is done to each of the seven faces of the god that one wishes to ask for aid. Holding hands and singing is often part of worship and prayer. Candles can be lit in honour to the gods, although the stranger typically receives the fewest candles. People may wear signs of devotion to a particular god, such as a small iron hammer on a thong, you know, a necklace. For the smith, crystals and light are important elements in the faith. The seven colours of the rainbow are important to the faith as well. The warrior's sons wore rainbow cloaks, and the peace banner of the faith is a rainbow-striped flag with seven long tails, on a staff topped by a seven-pointed star. The faith has a number of holy books. The most important one is the seven-pointed star, which contains the maiden's book. The seven-pointed star tells, among others, about the history of the faith. Septons who cannot read or write memorize prayers, rituals, and ceremonies, and are often able to recite long passages from the seven-pointed star. Hymns for a particular god can be sung during prayer. There is also a children's lullaby about the seven, the Song of the Seven, which honors all the gods except for the stranger, as no one ever sings about him. So they have priests like Catholicism, 
The male and female gods sworn of the faith are called septons and septers. Upon taking their vows, they set aside their last names, even if they come from noble families. Septons often wear white robes, seven stranded belts of different colors, and a crystal around their neck. They lead worship with incense, censers, and songs. Scepters typically dress in white robes with woven seven-color belts. They sometimes wear hoods, but not always, and their hair can be seen, which is unlike nuns in their full get-up, you know, the habit. Scepters may serve as governesses in noble households. Septa Mordain, for example, serves House Stark. In villages which are too small to support a septon, a septon from a neighbouring village might visit twice a year. Other times, a wandering septon, a septon who travels from village to village, without a specific sept at which he serves, might visit these small villages. These septons perform holy services, marriages, and forgive sins. While the septon is visiting the village, the people must provide him with food and a place to sleep. They also have something called a high septon. And let's not start getting, get, you know, don't get confused with a maester. A maester, the maester order is not religious. So we've already spoke about priests. We've also got a high septon. The head of the faith is the high septon, the father of the faithful, the voice of the new gods on earth, which is kind of like the Pope in Christian religion. The most devout, a council of the highest ranking septons, elect the high septon, usually from among their own ranks, although there have been notable exceptions. The septon who is elected gives up his name, as the faith believes that the high septon no longer has any need of a man's name, since he has become the avatar of the gods. Typically, the high septon wears long white robes and a crown, Septons from the most devout wear robes of cloth of silver and crystal coronets. We've got the Silent Sisters. The Silent Sisters are tasked with preparing the deceased for the grave. They dress in grey robes, their faces hooded and shawled, so only their eyes remain visible, as it's ill fortune to look upon the face of death. The Silent Sisters do not speak to the living, and although some claim that the Silent Sisters have their tongues cut out, in truth, the Silent Sisters have simply taken a vow of silence. The bodies of the deceased are given over to the Silent Sisters for ritual cleansing. The Silent Sisters remove the bowel and organs and drain the blood from the corpses in their care. They may also stuff the body with fragrant herbs and salts to preserve it and hide the smell of decomposition. When the deceased is transported back home, one or more Silent Sisters might accompany the body. Due to their task, the Silent Sisters are also called Death's Handmaidens and Handmaidens of the Stranger. Some even say that they are the wives to the stranger. The body of the deceased, especially if it concerns a nobility of high importance, might be placed on a bier. During funerals for dignitaries, which can last for several days. Prayers are held on three occasions. While the morning services are open to only nobility, the afternoon prayers are open to the small folk, and the evening prayers are available for all. People of lesser importance or status might be placed upon a bier elsewhere. A family member, friend, or even a concerned stranger stands last vigil, which is something that we see Jamie do. When a man is laid in his grave, a septon usually says some prayers for him. The prayer begins with, Father above, judge, whoever this person is, justly. A crystal might also be placed upon the grave. There are also something called holy brothers and sisters. Humbler members of the faith include holy brothers and holy sisters. Many of the Holy Brothers wear tonsures, cutting the hair on their scalps as an act of humility, and to show the Father that they have nothing to hide. Holy Brothers often wear robes of brown, dun, or green. Holy Sisters can wear robes of white, 
blue or grey. Brothers can serve at sectaries, which are communities of the faith, similar to monasteries. Some holy brothers wear the iron hammer of the smith about their neck. The brothers live in quiet contemplation and pray at these sectaries, and they often take vows of silence. The leader of the community, the elder brother, is assisted by proctors. Mother houses are the corresponding communities for women. Begging brothers travel from place to place, but are not to be confused with the wandering septons, as the latter one rank higher in the faith's hierarchy. The begging brothers are often dressed in threadbare or rough spun robes of undyed wool, belted with a hempen rope, and some go about barefoot. Some wear a bowl on a leather thong around their necks. No, not that type of thong. Wandering in the realm as a begging brother might be done as penance. They've also got the Faith Militant, which we did see in Game of Thrones because they had a little bit of an uprising. The Faith Militant was the military arm of the Faith of the Seven, under the command of the High Septon. It was composed of two military orders, the Warrior's Sons, an order of knights who gave up their lands and gold, swearing their sword to the High Septon, and the Poor Fellows, made up from common men, hedge knights and the like, who guarded and escorted travellers. The two orders were also known as the Swords and the Stars for their respective symbols. The Faith Militant is therefore known as the Swords and Stars or Stars and Swords. The Faith Militant was outlawed during the reign of King Magor Targaryen I and disbanded by the High Septon during the reign of King Jaehaerys Targaryen I. So what are the practices of the Faith of the Seven? Well, Let's start with their rights and privileges. The faith traditionally held several rights, apart from the right to maintain its own military orders like the faith militant and those subdivisions. The faith also had the right to hold its own ecclesiastical courts to try servants of the faith accused of wrongdoing, who were exempt from being tried in the lordly courts of local monarchs. In addition, the faith's substantial wealth and properties were exempt from taxation. King Aegon Targaryen I tread lightly with the faith and upheld all of these rights during his reign. Aegon's second son, King Maegor, outlawed the faith militant during the faith militant uprising. King Jaehaerys Targaryen I and his hand of the king, Septon Barth, reconciled the Iron Throne with the faith in exchange for the promise that the Iron Throne would always protect and defend the faith. The last few warriors' sons and poor fellows put down their weapons. Additionally, the Faith agreed to accept justice from the Iron Throne, instead of being able to try the faithful themselves. Whether or not the Faith retained the tax exemption on its wealth and properties after Jaehaerys' time is unknown. The Faith of the Seven is the predominant religion of the Seven Kingdoms. It's practiced in Dorne, the Reach, the Stormlands, the Crownlands, the Riverlands, the Westerlands, and the Vale of Arryn. Only on the Iron Islands and in the North are followers of the Faith very few. Although the laws of the Iron Throne and the gods are seen as separate, teachings of the Faith have a heavy influence on the law and justice of the realm. The Faith preaches against prostitution, gambling, and bastardy. It holds slavery to be an abomination and considers polygamy and incest, except for Targaryens under the doctrine of exceptionalism, and prostitution as monstrous and vile sins. Followers of the faith consider no man as accursed as the kinslayer, although the degree of kin and circumstance of killing one's kin, for example in war, hold significant influence. In association with the seven aspects of their god, the number seven is considered holy. Septons speak of the seven aspects of grace during prayer, and the gods are said to have made the seven wonders. In the night sky, seven wanderers, held sacred by the faith, can be seen, each sacred to one of the seven. The red wanderer is held to be sacred to the smith. Seven oils are used 
during part of a child naming ceremony, as part of the knighting ceremony, and when anointing a king. They also have holy days, similar again in the way that Catholicism has holy days like Easter. The faith of the seven has, the seventh day of the seventh moon is a day deemed sacred to the gods. Of course, because they're all about sevens. The seventh day of the week may be a time to gather in a sept for prayers, a bit like church on Sundays. Each of the seven gods of the faith has their own holy day. Only three of them are currently known by name. So we have Maiden's Day, a day on which maidens of noble houses are required to go to the set to light tall white candles at the maiden's feet and hang parchment garlands around her neck. Mothers, prostitutes, widows and men are barred from the set. Those maidens who enter the sept sing songs of innocence, feast day of our father above, considered to be the day for making judgments, and smith's day. And they also have trials for their justice system, which follow in a religious format. Trials can be presided over by septum. During a regular trial, the septum will begin with a prayer beseeching the Father above to guide them towards justice. During the trial, the septon will raise a crystal sphere above his head. He might ask the gods to look down and bear witness upon the trial, and help them find truth in the soul of the accused, granting the accused life and freedom if innocent, and death if guilty, or beseech the Father to aid in judgment, and the warrior to lend strength to the person whose cause is just. A special form of trial by combat, which is seldom used, is the Trial of Seven. The custom originates from the Andals, who believed that the gods would be honoured to see seven champions fight on each side, and therefore be more likely to see that justice was done. The accused is to find six others to stand with him in battle. If he is unable to do so, he is considered to be guilty. So what about the marriage customs that they believe in then? Well, a marriage ceremony takes place in a sept. The ceremony is presided over by a septon and involves prayers, vows, singing and the lighting of candles. Thus far, all wedding gowns that have been described during ceremonies performed following the customs of the faith have been a shade of white, such as ivory samites and ivory silk. The bride also wears a cloak of the colours of her house, called the maiden's cloak. The bride's father, or the person standing in his place, usually kin or whoever else is closest to living kin, will escort the bride to the marriage altar, which is placed between the statues of the mother and the father, where the septon and the groom will await her. Seven vows are made, seven blessings are invoked, and seven promises are exchanged. After which, a wedding song is sung. Next, a challenge is made to speak against the marriage, and if the challenge goes unanswered, the wedding cloaks are exchanged. The bride's father, or the person standing in his place, removes the cloak from the bride's shoulders, so that her husband can place a cloak of his own house colours about her shoulders. This signifies the bride passing from her father's protection into her husband's protection, the bride and groom speak the words, With this kiss, I pledge my love, potentially followed with an additional, And take you for my lord and husband, and And take you for my lady and wife, by the bride and groom, respectively. After which, a septum will declare them to be man and wife, stating that they are one flesh, one heart, one soul, now and forever. The wedding ceremony is followed by a feast, a wedding pie will be presented during the feast, which is filled with living birds like songbirds, blue jays, skylarks, pigeons, doves, mockingbirds, nightingales, sparrows, parrots, oh my god, and a cuddly toy. The bride and groom cut open the pie, allowing the birds to fly away. After the feast follows the bedding. The septon has prayed his prayers. Some words were said. And Lord Edmure has wrapped my daughter in a cloak. But they are not yet man and wife. A sword needs a sheath. 
<laughs> and the wedding needs a bedding. The bride is escorted to her bedroom, usually by the men of the feast, who will undress her along the way while making rude jokes. The women at the feast will do the groom the same honours. Usually, once the bride and groom are in the bedchamber, they are left alone, though wedding guests might stand on the other side of the door, shouting suggestions. Nonetheless, in some cases, witnesses might be present for the bedding, though it's unknown how far this witness duty goes. A marriage that has not been consummated can be set aside by a high septon or a council of faith. Neither bride nor groom needs to be present for an annulment. However, it must be requested by at least one of the wedded pair. Divorce in Westeros is not common. However, a king is able to put aside his queen, even if she has given birth to his children, and marry another. Okay, so you've lived, you've had your rights and privileges, you've gone married, but what do they believe in when you die? What about the afterlife? According to the seven-pointed star, lives are like candle flames, easily snuffed out by errant winds. The septons teach that the afterlife is a sweet surcease, and sing of voyaging to a far sweet land where men and women may laugh and love and feast until the end of days in the Father's golden hall. The faith holds that there are seven heavens and seven hells, each of the seven hells is deeper than the next. Sinners who do not repent their sins go to the seven hells. Although, the seven-pointed star states that all sins may be forgiven, crimes must still be punished. The lord of the seven hells is said to command demons and practice the black arts. George R. R. Martin himself has also stated that the amount of power the faith has, similarly to the Catholic Church, in great part depends on who has been chosen as High Septon, or in the case of the Catholic Church, as Pope, and the Faith Militant is loosely based on crusading orders like the Knights Templar. Right, that's the Faith of the Seven. Um, I My voice is going, so I'm just going to call it a day there. You can tell me your real-world relations to the Faith of the Seven in the comments, I'm sure. Um, also, this is the last time you'll see me with blue hair because I'm going to change it. I've already bought the dye, so can't take recommendations, but you can guess what colour. Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit that notification bell thing. And I'll see you next time. Cheerio.